I think when most people think of Regency style, they have a very preconceived idea of, of what that involves. They're quite pared down, very elegant, very simple in some ways. And actually, George IV's interiors were completely different to this. His architectural schemes were very adventurous, very exciting, very lavish, very opulent. George gives his name to the Regency, he's the Prince Regent, but his style is very different from what we think of as a Regency taste. People think of Jane Austen and um, wonderful striped fabrics and um, those lovely Egyptian-inspired designs, but, but for George it's very different. His architecture is very innovative, very unusual, and his interior designers as well. George was given Carlton House his first London residence in 1783 when he turned 21. Carlton House stood on the Mall, where Carlton House Terrace now stands. It was on a sloping site that overlooked St James's Park. It no longer survives, but we have a good idea of what it looked like from the watercolours and from many eyewitness accounts. At Carlton House, George was able to experiment with a wide range of architectural styles, and it sort of became a testing ground for his later schemes that bore fruit at Brighton, at Windsor, and at Buckingham Palace. Carlton House really had two problems. One was that the rooms were, in actual fact, quite small, and he didn't have space for his grand architectural ambitions there. The other problem with the house was that it was structurally unsound, and certainly by the 1820s, it was deemed unsalvageable and it was demolished. There are some remnants of the house which have been taken from the site and reused elsewhere. So the great portico is now incorporated into the facade of the National Gallery in London. Today, George's artistic legacy is best seen in those architectural schemes, Buckingham Palace, Windsor Castle, Brighton Pavilion. Brighton was a really fashionable seaside resort and George first visited it with his uncle, the Duke of Cumberland, in his early 20s. For George, the appeal was perhaps that it was an area where he could gamble, he could watch horse racing. There's also a very practical reason. The waters at Brighton were thought to have a restorative, a curative power, so George could undertake bathing for medical purposes. Shortly after he first visits with his uncle, he purchases his own seaside residence, a relatively comfortable house, but not a large one, overlooking the sea. At first, he decides to expand that smallish house into a larger residence, more befitting a member of the royal family, and he employs Henry Holland, who is a very fashionable architect to do so. After Holland has designed that first marine pavilion, George becomes more and more adventurous, and he initially employs a man called William Porden to design some stables in this fantastic Indian style. And from there he takes on John Nash, another architect who also works on Buckingham Palace, to work on transforming that beautiful, elegant Holland building into an oriental fantasy. The interiors at Brighton are fascinating. George employs a family called the Crace family to help him design the interiors and they create this incredible mix of style inspired by the art and architecture of China and also by the art and architecture of France. So it's an incredible mix of styles, but it's incredibly successful. My favourite is the banqueting room, which is absolutely fantastic. It's a huge room which has got this incredible ceiling and at the centre of the ceiling is a chandelier, which looks as if it is being held, suspended in midair by a tremendous flying dragon. And you imagine how that must have been to eat in that banqueting room. George used this as a party pavilion and to have sat there and to have looked up in the candlelight and seen a dragon holding the light overhead. Throughout the 18th century, there had been no large palace in London. St James's Palace had stood in for the central functions of the court, but it was rather ramshackle, the rooms were quite small, and it was starting to feel very outdated. So in 1820, when George came to the throne, he wanted to create a brand new, exciting palace to rival somewhere like Versailles in Paris. Buckingham House was a relatively small house on the edge of London. George wanted to create a grand palace, so he increased it in size. He opened up the space around it so that anyone visiting London would know instantly 
who was living within. And in the front, he placed a large triumphal arch representing his victory over Napoleon. One of George's aims at Buckingham Palace was to enhance the feeling of historical continuity. And he did this by including sculptural elements such as the reliefs on the facade, which show key moments in British history. Windsor Castle is important because it has been home to the monarchy since the 11th century. So George, rather than being innovative at Windsor, is looking back to the history of the castle and he wants to restore its Gothic appearance. Charles II had introduced lots of very exciting Baroque elements at Windsor in the 17th century, but George wants to take it back before Charles II to the Middle Ages. Fascinatingly, George does this with Geoffrey Wyattville, his architect, by changing the skyline of the castle. And the most visible thing he does, which is still the most visible thing at the castle today, is he raises the height of the central round tower, which was originally very flat, and he builds it up. So this is the most incredible thing you see from such a distance, this huge tower that dominates the skyline. Although George is thinking of the Gothic at Windsor, he's also thinking of French inspiration in his spaces designed for his own private use. The green drawing room, the crimson drawing room, look back to his early interest in the neoclassical and to French decorative styles. George's architecture is so important because it tells us so much about his interests. It was how he displayed the art that he collected, that incredible collection that he formed, and the collection informs his architecture as much as his architectural interests inform his collecting. And it's the architecture that you see today, it's that great skyline at Windsor Castle, it's Buckingham Palace, it's Brighton Pavilion, even Carlton House, which doesn't survive, is an incredibly important building for our understanding of George and for our understanding of 18th century taste.